Good morning. The Secretary General will uh, update you on tomorrow's ministerial, and then, as usual, he'll be very happy to take your questions. Secretary General. Good morning. Uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, NATO's uh, foreign ministers will uh, meet and address uh, a wide range of security challenges. Violent extremism in uh, North Africa and uh, the Middle East, continuing instability in Afghanistan, and Russia's destabilizing uh, behavior. We will discuss <coughs> the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty. This treaty eliminated an entire category of uh, uh, weapons, but uh, it has been put in jeopardy by Russia. Russia has developed, produced, and deployed a new missile. It is mobile and hard to detect. It is nuclear capable, and it could reach European cities with little or no warning time. The United States is in full compliance uh, with the INF uh, Treaty. There are no new US missiles in Europe but there are new Russian missiles. Russia must take immediate steps to ensure full compliance with the INF Treaty in a transparent and verifiable way. NATO is a strong advocate uh, for arms control to make us all safer. We seek dialogue with Russia and we aspire uh, to improve relations. But to make this possible, Russia must fully comply with its international uh, commitments. Tomorrow, we will meet uh, our partners, uh, Georgia and Ukraine. They both face serious security challenges from Russia. And we will continue to give both countries practical and political support. Russia recently seized Ukrainian ships and sailors near the Kerch Strait. There is no justification for this use of force. We call for calm and restraint. Russia must release the Ukrainian sailors and ships. It must also allow freedom of navigation and unhindered access to Ukrainian ports in the Sea of Azov. Ukrainian vessels, military as well as civilian, have the right to navigate through the Kirk Strait and the Sea of Azov. <clears throat> Tomorrow night, we will address challenges coming from the Middle East and North Africa. We will discuss our, uh, our support to our partners in the region. This includes capacity building, counterterrorism, and further developing our partnerships. We will discuss Iraq, where we are helping train local forces, and our experts are helping set up defense education facilities. This supports uh, Iraq as it tackles terrorism at its root. So it will strengthen our collective fight against international terrorism. On Wednesday, we will have a meeting on the Western Balkans, joined by the EU High Representative uh, Federica Mogherini. Because the region is of key strategic interest for both NATO and the European Union. We have seen Skopje's progress towards becoming NATO's 30th member. It is now for the authorities in Skopje to implement the name agreement. When that is complete, we will be able to sign the accession protocol. We will discuss taking the next steps in developing NATO's relationship with Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I expect ministers to endorse NATO's readiness to accept um, Bosnia's first annual national program. This is an important tool which can help the country implement political, economic and defense reforms. It is now up to Bosnia and Herzegovina to decide to take up, to take up this offer. We will conclude the ministerial with a meeting of all nations contributing to the rest of support uh, mission in Afghanistan. The challenge in Afghanistan is great, and allies have suffered fatalities 
in recent months, as have Afghan forces and civilians. We must continue to ensure that the country never again becomes a safe haven for international terrorists. Over the past months, we have stepped up our support with more forces and funding because the cost of leaving is bigger than the cost of staying. As you can see, we have a lot of ground to cover during our ministerial, and now I'm open to take your questions. Okay, uh, <coughs> we'll go with Washington Post over there, yeah. Hi, Michael Birnbaum from the Washington Post. Um, on balance, uh, is European security improved or worsened by the INF Treaty when only one side is observing it? Thank you. The situation we have now is untenable. It cannot continue like that uh, because no arms control agreement uh, will work, will be effective if it's only respected by one part. And that's the reason why this was a main topic when heads of state and government met here at NATO in July. That was, that's the reason why this was a main topic at the Defense Ministerial uh, in October. And that's the reason why INF is once again a main issue when uh, foreign ministers uh, meet uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, because uh, we are strong supporters of arms control, but only if it is balanced, verifiable, and respected. And uh, all allies are concerned uh, the, about Russia compliance with the INF Treaty. Uh, we call on Russia to uh, comply with the treaty in a verifiable and transparent uh, way. And uh, uh, we, of course, need to make sure that we are able uh, to continue to keep all allies safe and secure. And we will take the necessary decisions uh, to make uh, uh, sure that that's also uh, 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 the fact in the future. Uh, and that's the reason why we're going to have INF as one of the main issues to be discussed uh, at the meeting tomorrow. Wall Street Journal, <coughs> behind, yeah. Uh, Dan Michaels, Wall Street Journal. Uh, NATO members have said that what Russia is doing, both with um, its new missile and in the Sea of Azov, in violation of agreements, uh, illegal. Uh, but it looks like NATO and members are just offering strongly worded messages. Uh, do you need to do more than just words? Uh, is this a bit lopsided, actions versus words? Thank you. So we provide strong political, but also strong practical support to Ukraine. Uh, since uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, we have provided uh, the support in different forms, uh, help them with modernize their armed forces, uh, command and control, uh, cyber, hybrid, uh, but also several NATO allies provide uh, bilateral support with training and equipment. So NATO and NATO allies have and are providing strong uh, practical support to Ukraine. We also provide, of course, political support, uh, supporting their territorial integrity and their sovereignty. And uh, we support uh, the efforts to find a peaceful negotiated solution, uh, the Minsk agreements, and uh, we support the efforts of the Normandy uh, format. Then NATO has increased its military presence in the Black Sea region uh, with uh, a more naval presence. Uh, last year, the number of days with the NATO ships or ships under NATO command in the, in the Black Sea increased from 80 uh, to 120. And there are also, of course, uh, uh, NATO allies which have uh, deployed uh, ships in the uh, Black Sea uh, uh, outside the NATO framework, but still there are uh, NATO allies. Then we have three literal states, uh, Turkey, Romania, and Bulgaria with their naval uh, uh, capabilities. We have NATO air policing over the Black Sea uh, region, and we have a new uh, brigade, uh, multinational brigade in uh, Romania. Uh, we have more ISR, more intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance. So we are closely monitoring the situation. We have increased our presence, and we continue uh, to call on Russia to um, 
uh, release the sailors, re release the ships, uh, and uh, to respect uh, freedom of navigation and, uh, and respect the right of Ukraine uh, to uh, move through the Kerch Strait and into the Azov uh, Sea. We will assess closely Russia's, or we are closely monitoring and assessing Russia's military posture. And that's the reason why we have implemented the biggest re, uh, uh, adaptation, the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War. With battle groups in the eastern part of the lines, with high readiness of, of our forces, and, the fir and for the first time in many years, uh, uh, we also see that European allies and Canada are investing more in defense. We also, of course, assess closely um, uh, Russia when it comes to uh, intermediate range forces, and we will make the necessary decisions uh, to make sure that uh, we provide credible deterrence, credible defense, and that we keep all allies safe and uh, secure. Agence France Presse. Yeah, over there. Up. Thanks. Uh, hello, good morning. Damon Wake, uh, AFP. Well, what new practical measures can you offer to Ukraine to help them? regain freedom of navigation in the Sea of Azov. You've mentioned several things that have already been put into place, but what new measures can you offer? I think it is, it is very important what we do, uh, and that is that we provide a strong political and practical support to uh, Ukraine, and that we have increased our presence in the Black Sea uh, region, including in the Black Sea. <coughs> Uh, and then, of course, it's a bit early for me to say uh, what ministers uh, will uh, uh, discuss at the meeting uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, so I can report more about that after the meeting. Uh, but I expect uh, uh, allies to be very concerned about the situation and uh, convey a very uh, clear message to Russia uh, of the importance of uh, uh, not using the fact that they have illegally annexed Crimea and then illegally built the bridge which links uh, Crimea to, the, the, to, uh, to Russia. And now using that bridge and the illegal annexation of Crimea uh, to impede uh, uh, the movement of Ukrainian vessels uh, to the Kerch Straits and into the Azov Sea. Okay, we had uh, National Public Radio. Yeah. Thank you, Terry Schultz with NPR and Deutsche Welle. Um, do you believe that the U.S. is going to use this meeting to announce its formal withdrawal from the INF Treaty, um, or that it uh, will wait until at least a couple of months from now till the defense minister's meeting? And um, would two months make any difference in would two, would a two month wait make any difference in potentially Russia's understanding that this is going to happen and it needs to come into compliance? Or um, what kind of benefits would be would be made in, in giving it a, another couple months? Thanks. The U.S. has, uh, uh, has, con in con uh, has briefed allies on their uh, assessment about the uh, new Russian missiles. Uh, we had, they have done that uh, extensively over uh, months. Uh, uh, they have briefed um, here at NATO headquarters. They have uh, briefed in different capitals. And we have discussed uh, the INF issue and the consequences uh, extensively uh, in NATO for uh, a long uh, period. Uh, we all know that the time is running out, that this is not tenable, that uh, we have an arms control agreement which is only respected by one part. Uh, so we will of course discuss this at our meeting. Uh, I think it's a bit early for me today to announce what ministers will say and uh, conclude tomorrow, uh, but it goes without saying that all allies uh, agree that this is very serious because the INF Treaty uh, has been so important for European security, abolished the whole category of weapons. And actually, I think that the deployment of uh, SS-20s, uh, Russian SS-20s in the 70s and 80s, and Pershing and cruise missiles by US and NATO in the, in the 80s, uh, shaped a whole generation of politicians in their understanding of security issues, including myself. And therefore, we also understand the seriousness of uh, this uh, treaty uh, breaking uh, down. Uh, the exact timing, the exact sequencing, and, and, and so on, I will not comment on that now. The only thing I will say is that 
the situation as we have it now cannot continue. And uh, NATO allies are now discussing how to deal with uh, this very serious issue. Financial Times, Pedro. Thank you very much, Michael Peel, Financial Times. Uh, to follow up on Terry's question, if Russia does not do what uh, NATO and the US want on this, um, do you think that it would be justified and helpful for the US to redeploy uh, or to deploy new missiles in Europe as in a response? And also, could you um, just speak briefly about uh, Bosnia and whether you think that the decision to activate the map on that will complicate your discussions with NATO's discussions with Russia on other matters and indeed perhaps disappoint Georgia, which has its own membership aspirations? Thanks. NATO allies call on Russia to ensure full compliance with the INF Treaty in a verifiable and transparent way. We do that because uh, we believe that this treaty has been important for our security and because we are concerned about Russian compliance uh, and concerned about the new missile they are uh, deploying in Europe, aiming uh, at uh, uh, so e e able to reach European cities within uh, uh, minutes. Um, we will, of course, uh, and we are also, also, of course, assessing the consequences of what's now happening. And uh, we will take the necessary decisions uh, to make uh, all allies safe and secure and to make sure that we uh, continue to have credible deterrence and defense. NATO will not mirror what Russia does, plane by plane or missile by missile or uh, battle tank by battle tank. But we will make sure that we have the necessary capabilities, the necessary resolve, the necessary readiness to provide credible deterrence. Because we know that that's the best way of preventing a conflict. And when the world is changing, when we see a more assertive Russia, when we see Russia developing new missiles, new uh, nuclear weapons, uh, increasing their capabilities, then we are responding. Not by mirroring exactly what they're doing, um, but by uh, responding in a measured, uh, proportionate, and uh, firm uh, way. We have done that over the last years with the first deployment of battle groups in the eastern part of the Alliance, increased readiness of forces, and now also investments in new uh, military capabilities by all European allies and Canada. Um, uh, so, uh, and, uh, and then we will discuss this tomorrow, uh, understanding that time is running out, this cannot continue the situation we have now. On Bosnia, well, I expect uh, ministers uh, to agree that we uh, will be ready to uh, accept uh, uh, the first annual national program uh, of Bosnia. Then it's, then it's up to Bosnia and to decide, Bosnia and Herzegovina, to decide whether they uh, use this opportunity. Uh, but we uh, expect us to at least express that we are ready uh, to receive the first annual national program. Uh, for Georgia, I would like to say that uh, the annual national program is something Georgia has had for many years already. Uh, so uh, uh, Georgia has all the tools they need to become a member. Now uh, we are willing to uh, provide an annual national program uh, also to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay, we'll go to Georgian TV in the front. Uh, Georgian TV company, Rustavi too. I have uh, two questions to Secretary General. First of all, about uh, elections in Georgia. Um, international observers missions, they release critical uh, reports, not about only elections date, but pre-election situation. So how NATO estimates these elections? And the second question, uh, regard with the Azov Sea situation, how do you see uh, Georgia's and Ukraine's place in uh, Black Sea security. Thank you. So, <clears throat> NATO has three member states uh, as literal states uh, to the Black Sea, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania. Uh, then we have two partner countries, very close partners, uh, uh, highly valued partners, uh, uh, Georgia and, uh, and Ukraine. And of course, we work with them uh, all on issues related to Black Sea uh, security. Uh, and I expect also the Black Sea security in general, uh, but also the situation in the Sea of Azov will be discussed when we meet Ukraine and Georgia uh, tomorrow. And we work uh, with Georgia uh, 
uh, to modernize their armed forces uh, and build their uh, uh, different military capabilities. We have the training and evaluation center in Tbilisi, but we have also worked with Georgia on strengthening their Coast Guard. So NATO is also working uh, with Georgia in strengthening their naval capabilities. We do so also with Ukraine. Uh, we um, have uh, support from NATO uh, when it comes to their um, Naval Academy in, in, in Odessa. So we work with the naval capabilities of both Ukraine and uh, Georgia, showing that this practical cooperation has a value for the partners, but also for NATO, because when our, when our neighbors are more stable, we are more secure, and therefore it is in our interest to work with Ukraine and uh, Georgia in different ways, distinct different partnerships, but uh, uh, two uh, highly valued partners which have both suffered uh, from uh, uh, Russian uh, aggressive uh, actions. Um, I congratulate the new president of uh, uh, Georgia. Uh, uh, NATO is not election uh, 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 so we, are not sending, we don't have election observers, so there are other organizations that do that, and I just think it's extremely important that election observers have full access and that uh, the concerns they have put forward are uh, addressed in a transparent and, uh, and, and open way. Okay, we'll go to Radio Free Europe in the front row here, gentleman in the blue sweater. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, uh, the cost of uh, leaving Afghanistan is bigger than uh, the cost of uh, staying in the country. My question is that, why is it important for NATO uh, to uh, keep its presence uh, in Afghanistan? Thank you. <coughs> It's important for NATO to keep its presence in Afghanistan because we have to uh, uh, prevent Afghanistan from uh, once again becoming a platform uh, to plan, to organize, uh, to execute terrorist attacks against our own countries. It cannot once again become a safe haven for international terrorists. There is a high cost of staying in Afghanistan. There is a high financial cost for NATO allies and there is a high uh, human cost. We have fas uh, fatalities. Uh, also the uh, last weeks. Uh, but we have to compare the cost of staying with the cost of leaving. And if NATO and NATO allies left Afghanistan, we have to be prepared that there is a high risk that Taliban will come back and that different terrorist organizations will be able to gain ground and establish uh, uh, strong footholds uh, in Afghanistan. Um, for instance, we know that Al-Qaeda is there, we know that ISIS is there, and we know that uh, ISIS is working uh, with uh, the core ISIS in Levant, uh, and also they have networks in, uh, stretching into uh, Europe. So this is about helping Afghanistan, but it's also about helping ourselves. It's about making our citizens more secure by uh, avoiding that uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, other terrorist organizations are able to really re-establish themselves uh, in Afghanistan. We have to remember that we have been fighting ISIS in Iraq and Syria for years, and we have made a lot of progress. But we have to be sure that the caliphate ISIS lost in Iraq and Syria is not re-established in Afghanistan. And that's one of the reasons why we are there. And I visited uh, Afghanistan recently, and I'm impressed by the commitment the courage and the professionalism of the Afghan forces, and we continue to train, assist, and advise them. Okay, we go to Tolo TV. Yeah. Gentleman with the red scarf, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Parvez Shamol from Tolo News, Afghanistan. <coughs> uh, there are uh, two options and time frames for uh, peace process in Afghanistan. Uh, the government says, uh, it will take five years to get uh, some results, but uh, the US, US uh, trying to get re results uh, before upcoming election in April. If the US efforts get some results before the election and it need uh, to postpone the election, will you support it? Thank you. It is important that uh, Afghanistan uh, holds elections because elections is a of course, key to any democratic society. 
Uh, then I will say it is up to the Afghan authorities exactly to decide exactly when, uh, taking into account the security situation and other uh, issues. And I think also there are some lessons learned from the parliamentary elections, uh, which uh, should be taken into account when Afghanistan now is preparing for the presidential elections. Uh, I was assured when I visited Afghanistan a few weeks ago that the elections will be held uh, and that they also will uh, learn the lessons from the parliamentary elections. And again, I think that what we have seen is the strength of the Afghan security forces because they have been able to provide security for the parliamentary elections, uh, uh, which was a very demanding and difficult task. And they did so uh, with our train, but it actually Afghan uh, train and system device, but it was actually Afghan forces that were able to do that. Okay, we'll go to the gentleman in the front row here with glasses from Pyron. Uh, Secretary General, you mentioned the accession process with NATO and Macedonia. Uh, the ball is, so to speak, rolling in Macedonian Parliament concerning the constitutional changes. Are you convinced that if Macedonia delivers the Greek? side will deliver its part of the agreement. And you mentioned also safe haven. What about NATO credibility of uh, uh, safe havening a politician, politician uh, who is fleeing from justice? I mean about Nikola Gravsky case and Hungary. Uh, first on Skopje. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's for the parliament and for the authorities in Skopje uh, to uh, make the decisions. I cannot guarantee uh, on behalf, behalf of Skopje. Uh, that's for them to decide. Uh, but what we have seen is that uh, uh, the first uh, uh, vote in the parliament where it was required to third majority, it was a two third majority for initiate this process. Uh, whether there will be a two third majority the next time uh, when they have the final vote, uh, that's not for me uh, to speculate. Uh, uh, but what I can say, what I can say is that uh, as soon as uh, the uh, name uh, deal or agreement is implemented, then we are ready to uh, sign the accession protocol. And as soon as we sign the accession protocol with Skopje, uh, the government of Skopje will start to meet uh, at our ministerial uh, meetings. And then we need the ratification of all allies before we have the full membership. Uh, so I really hope uh, that uh, uh, Skopje and the people of the country use this historic and once in a lifetime opportunity to join NATO and we are ready to welcome them uh, as our 30th uh, uh, member. Um, um, then at the I didn't really get to the last... In, in Hungary, oh, NATO, yeah, yeah, NATO yeah, member okay, country. Yeah. No, I think uh, that's not for me to comment on. I think that uh, uh, that's an issue that has to be uh, addressed between uh, Budapest and uh, Skopje, not for uh, NATO. We'll go to the lady in the middle there, yeah, from the Kosovo media, yeah. Yes, Secretary General, as uh, Madame Mogherini will participate on the second day of ministerial, I guess the dialogue between Pristina and Belgrade will come up as an issue as well. Does NATO fear that it will face uh, security consequences after the possible implementation of the agreement between both sides, which hypothetically might include border corrections? So first, <coughs> I... <coughs> I think it's important to highlight how strongly NATO support the Belgrade-Pristina dialogue, because that's the only way to solve the outstanding uh, issues. And we welcome the efforts by the European Union, by uh, High Representative Federica Mogherini. I recently visited uh, Belgrade, and one of my main messages there was the importance of the uh, of the uh, Pristina Belgrade uh, uh, dialogue. Um, uh, second, I think it is important that uh, uh, all actors uh, refrain from uh, uh, provocative actions and provocative rhetoric uh, to try to uh, reduce tensions and to try to uh, make uh, uh, progress. Uh, and, um, and NATO uh, will continue to be present in Kosovo. We have our 
uh, K4 operation there, uh, which is important for uh, stability. Uh, and uh, uh, K4 will continue to be impartial, uh, helping to make sure that uh, we have the necessary stability and security to see progress on uh, the political efforts to find a political and negotiated solution. When it comes to potential border uh, adjustments, I think that um, I will only say that um, uh, we support the dialogue uh, and uh, I hope that they will be able to find a solution which is accepted both by Belgrade and, uh, and Pristina. Okay, we'll go to Al Arabiya. Yeah. Nordin Fridi from Arabi New Zealand, Secretary General. Good morning. Can you, <clears throat> you spoke very well and you elaborated on the INF Treaty, Russia, United States, Black Sea situation, the serious threats. Uh, what is your assessment to the violent extremism in North Africa and Middle East? Do you consider these threats as a military threat or <coughs> mainly because of the weak states like some part in Libya, of course, maybe Tunisia, maybe Iraq, is that do, do you see military threats for the NATO security in North Africa and Middle East or mainly because of the weak states there? Thank you. When we look to the South, to the Middle East and uh, North Africa, we see many different threats and we see unpredictability and instability. So NATO has to be prepared for the unforeseen. Uh, we saw, for instance, not so many years ago that uh, ISIS was able actually to establish uh, control over large part of territory in Iraq and Syria, uh, controlling 8 million people, and we started to speak about uh, terrorist organizations with state-like uh, capacities. And of course, uh, ISIS was a, a real military threat uh, to both uh, Syria and, uh, and Iraq. And that's also the reason why NATO allies and NATO has uh, worked so hard uh, to uh, push back uh, ISIS, and we have made uh, real and significant progress uh, in doing that. Then we have terrorist organizations, we have uh, uh, different kind of criminal uh, groups, so we have to address the, all this variety of uh, threats and challenges. We work also together with uh, the European Union. Uh, NATO has naval presence in the Mediterranean Sea, providing support to Operation Sophia. And, uh, and we also work with partners like Tunisia, uh, Jordan in the region to help uh, keep them uh, stable. Okay, we had a gentleman over there. Yeah. Does the invitation to the Bosnian authorities to submit this annual national program means the activation of MAP? <coughs> First of all, I think that uh, uh, that uh, 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 we have now to, to wait and see uh, whether uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uses this opportunity. We have given them uh, an opportunity, then it is for Bosnia and Herzegovina to uh, decide. Uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina already has a map. Uh, we are now uh, ready to uh, accept uh, their submission of an annual, annual national uh, program and uh, it's for them to decide whether they do that. Okay, we have a gentleman in the second row. Thank you. Um, Secretary General, uh, Makola Siruk from Ukrainian Daily of the Day. Um, uh, why, in your opinion, strong deterrence, strong defense as a core task of NATO from uh, 2016 and meaningful dialogue with Russia do not bring any positive results? Instead, we see Russia more aggressive and latest example of which was this Azov situation. Uh, what may and should uh, NATO do more to convince Russia or <laughs> use as means, any means, Russia return to behave according to international norms? Because General Mattis, maybe you have read, has told, uh, describing Putin, we are dealing with uh, somebody whom we simply cannot trust. Please. Thanks. You are right that NATO has a dual track approach to Russia, defense uh, and uh, dialogue, uh, credible deterrence, credible defense combined with political dialogue. And I strongly believe in that dual track approach to Russia. 
because it is a very robust uh, strategy, uh, which is uh, working uh, in a way regardless of whether you believe that Russia will change in the near future or will not change in the foreseeable future. Because this combination of having both strength but also the openness for dialogue uh, is able to accommodate different scenarios. And therefore, uh, I welcome the fact that we have implemented the biggest reinforcement of collective defense since the end of the Cold War, that we continue to invest more in our uh, defense capabilities, but at the same time that we have been able to have political dialogue with Russia. Uh, for instance, on the INF issue, uh, the INF issue and the concerns all allies have about Russian compliance has been discussed in the NATO Russia Council. We, uh, we raised our concerns directly with Russia in the NATO Russia Council a few weeks ago. So as allies, uh, we have raised this issue with Russia uh, uh, several times, but also in the uh, NATO Russia Council. And we know that US as part of, uh, party of this, uh, uh, the, the INF Treaty have raised it many times directly with Russia. Uh, <coughs> calling on them to ensure uh, uh, compliance. So, uh, for me, there is no contradiction between strength and dialogue. I actually strongly believe that we need both. And as long as we are strong, as long as we are united, we can also engage in political dialogue with Russia. And let me add one more thing, and that is the following, is that even if you don't believe in an improved relationship with Russia in the foreseeable future, even then, we need political dialogue with Russia to manage a difficult relationship. For instance, with more exercises, more military presence, higher tensions, uh, we need to avoid incidents and accidents. Uh, and therefore, the fact that we use the NATO-Russia Council, the dialogue with Russia, to brief each other on military exercises, on military posture, to raise issues as the INF uh, uh, Treaty, helps to manage a difficult relationship, uh, which is also important because the alternative is that incidents, accidents may happen and then spiral out of control and create really uh, dangerous uh, uh, situations. So for instance, add to that also that we have the, uh, mil uh, the pol uh, military lines of communications, and I welcome that Sakur, uh, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, has met with uh, Garasimov, and they continue to have uh, direct contact, which I think is useful for all of us. Okay, we have one last question in front. Uh, thank you very much. Russian Radio Echo of Moscow, Alexei Gusarov. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, the President of Ukraine urged NATO uh, to send battleships to the Sea of Azov. Uh, will they be there and how NATO uh, responds to such requests? So NATO has already increased our presence uh, in the Black Sea. Uh, significantly more, uh, as an example, just significantly more uh, days uh, with NATO ships uh, at sea uh, in uh, this year than last year, uh, the previous year, and um, and uh, uh, and we have more. Uh, we are air policing. We have more uh, um, uh, ISR. Uh, we have more uh, presence in the Black Sea uh, uh, in general, uh, and uh, and we have. Uh, and we will, of course, closely monitor uh, the situation uh, uh, in that region, uh, uh, also in light of what we saw uh, a few uh, days ago. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.